Good afternoon. My name is Isabel Rohr. I'm the Deputy Director of JDC Archives, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar in the context of the David and Ruth Muncher JDC Archives Fellowship. I'd like to start by saying a few words about JDC Archives. JDC Archives houses the records of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, also known as JDC, which is the leading Jewish global humanitarian organization. Researchers from around the world, as well as filmmakers, journalists, and others use our unique offerings for their research. We also offer fellowships to enable scholars to conduct research in our archives. One of those fellowships is the David and Ruth Musher JDC Archives Fellowship, which was established thanks to a generous gift from David and Ruth Marshall, who are longtime supporters of JDC with deep roots in the American Jewish com community and a longtime commitment to Jewish education and academic research. I would like to thank David and Ruth Marshall, who are with us today for their generosity in endowing this fellowship. David Marshall will actually introduce our speaker today, Dr. Anna Carla Augusta, who is the recipient of the JDC Archives Ruth and David Marshall Fellowship for 2023. After David's introduction, Anna Carla Augusta will speak for about 45 minutes. This will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Please note that your microphones are muted and that you can send us questions at any time during the webinar. Um, David Musher will now introduce uh, Dr. Anna Carolina Augusta. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anna Carolyn Augustin. Anna Carolyn Augustin is a postdoctoral researcher in history, working as a research fellow at the German Historical Institute in Washington, D.C. Her main field of research is modern German Jewish history and culture with an emphasis on Jewish material culture. She received her PhD in modern history from the University of Potsdam in 2016. At the same time, she completed a two year academic apprenticeship at the Jewish Museum in Berlin and worked on several exhibitions. Her first monograph was published in 2018 by Wallstein Publishing House. As a trained museum professional, she has also paid special attention to provenance research in the field of Judaica. In her current postdoc research project, she is examining several intertwined subjects, the biographies and migration paths of Jewish ritual objects, their changing attributions, meanings, and functions after 1945 for a study in cultural history taking a transnational approach. Dr. Augustin is the recipient of the 2023 Ruth and David Musher JDC Archives Fellowship. Dr. Anna Carolyn Augustin will now start her lecture. Thank you so much, David, for your kind introduction, um, but especially for the wonderful fellowship you and your wife sponsor, which has enabled me to research the rich sources of the JDC archives. Uh, that has really been uh, important to me. I'm also very grateful to Isabel Rohr um, for organizing this event um, and for being so helpful and knowledgeable. And um, also um, Abra Cohn, uh, I'm very grateful to all your support for providing the access actually to the artifacts themselves in, in, in storage in New York, and also to providing me with images for, for this talk. Thank you very, very much. So I will now go ahead and share my screen and start right away. On December 22nd last year, an Israeli online newspaper reported on the donation of a Torah scroll. The Torah had survived the Holocaust and was given to relatives of the Israeli Bibas family who was taken hostage by Hamas on October 7th, 
and whose fate remains unknown until today. A Jewish American family donated the Torah scroll on behalf of the Hebrew Academy of Long Beach in New York to show support for the community hit by the attack. As controversial as the comparison of the atrocities committed by Hamas with the Holocaust may be in current scholarly debate, the appreciation that family members and the small community felt for this gesture highlights the huge symbolic significance still attached to the Holocaust remnants today. It is well known, especially by memorial museum curators and historians of material culture, such as most prominently Laura Auslander, the trauma transforms ordinary objects into extraordinary, tangible historical evidence of life, death, and suffering. The distant traumatic past touches the present through the object. Objects of trauma embody suffering and the ability to make holy the profane, to say nothing about Torah scores that have a unique sacred quality in Judaism and are considered holy anyway. A preserved Holocaust object such as this Torah scroll bears witness to survival, may give comfort and faith, and perhaps bring healing. The newspaper article does not mention the exact provenance of the donated Torah scroll, so I don't know it, but perhaps it was found in a similar situation to the Torah scrolls in this historical photograph uh, taken shortly after the Second World War. The photograph depicts several abandoned Torah scrolls piled up and covered with textiles in a cellar room. A closer look reveals one of the textiles to be a Jewish prayer shawl, a talit. On the second photograph, we are probably still in the same cellar room, just looking into it from another angle. At the center, we see an old woman and a younger looking man holding hands. A younger looking man with a hat has his arm resting on his hips and he seems to be waiting. Around the group of people, we see large amounts of poorly preserved textiles, which are difficult to identify. But it's possible to see curtain rings, uh, which signal that some of these textiles were hanging pieces. We can also barely discern what looks like the tips of a Star of David and Hebrew letter appliques on some of them. The materiality and details such as fringes and Hebrew letter appliques suggest that these um, were Jewish ritual textiles such as Torah curtains, Torah mantles and Torah binders. There's also a third photograph with a different group of people but almost in the same setting. What exactly happened here and who these persons are is unknown. However, we know that these photographs document the moment of recovering Jewish ritual objects, which were hidden in a Berlin cellar during the Second World War. All these photographs are part of a scrapbook, which was assembled in 1946 by Holocaust survivor Pinkus Prozowski. Prozowski lived and worked at the Jewish DP camp Düppel in Berlin. The scrapbook covers the most important topics and events of everyday life, uh, for Jewish DPs, recovering Jewish ritual artifacts clearly being one of them. After the Holocaust, with the annihilation of European Jewry, its material culture was also largely destroyed. Only some scattered material remnants survived. Searching for, reclaiming and finding new homes for these remnants was a highly emotional, symbolic and contested process. It symbolized different ideas of Jewish survival and reconstruction, and hence the post for future of Jewry. On multiple levels, the JDC supported this kind of Jewish cultural reconstruction, the post war era. In my presentation today, I would like to focus only on a few of its aspects. First, my presentation will focus on the JDC support for the official restitution of Jewish um, ceremonial objects. Second, on unofficial reappropriation of them. And third, um, my lecture will deal with the JDC funded production and distribution of Judaica in post for Europe. After the Holocaust, the few remnants of Jewish material culture that still existed represented nothing, nothing less than the cultural, religious, material heritage of a European Jewry that had been destroyed. 
Right after the war, finding these artifacts, rescuing them and giving them back to the Jewish collective was an important matter of Jewish reconstruction and an imperative for survivors and the whole Jewish community. This was especially true for Jewish ritual objects, some of which are considered sacred and which were not only relevant for the religious practice, but also as cultural carriers of memory. On this slide, you can see a call for the collection of Jewish cultural artifacts by a DP historical commission in Göttingen, for instance, it shows um, additional ritual objects of interest, such as a precious metal menorah or a Torah shield. One must bear in mind that there existed a great variety of artistically designed Jewish ritual objects, sometimes also called Judaica or ceremonial objects that serve religious practice in Judaism. As religious observance declined in 19th century, and at the same time that scholarly research into Judaism emerged in the form of Wissenschaftliches Judentums, the meaning and function of these objects had been transformed. More and more, they were considered in terms of the historical, cultural, and aesthetic value. This was the beginning of the collecting, trading, and academic study of these objects. Judaica collections and the first Jewish museums emerged around the year 1900, and the subdiscipline of Jewish art history and museology flourished especially until the First World War. One of the most exquisite private Judaica collections in Germany was that of the Hamburg publisher Leo Lessmann, whose fate I've been researching together with a Dutch colleague for several years. A look into the so-called Sammlungsraum, the collection room in Lessmann's private apartment, demonstrates the collection's richness. During the Nazi period, however, the material culture of European Jewry vanished almost entirely. Museum collections, synagogue inventories, and ritual objects from private households were confiscated, looted, misused, sold, destroyed, or hidden. The Lessmann collection, which had been transferred by its owner to Amsterdam for protection, vanished after the Germans' evasion. Rarely did the rescue of Judaica collections to save exile succeed. The JDC was actively involved in one of the best known exceptions, the allocation of the Judaica items from the Gdansk Jewish community and the valuable Lesser Gelsinski collection from Poland to the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City. The transfer of these Jewish artifacts from Poland to the US was intended as temporary protection measure. The parties involved agreed in the late 1930s that the collection was only to remain on loan in New York for 15 years before being returned to the then re-emerging community in Gdansk. However, after the war and in view of the Holocaust and later the Cold War, a reconstruction of Jewish life, particularly in Eastern Europe and Germany, was unimaginable for most Jewish individuals and organizations, including the JDC. All major initiatives pursued by the JDC after 1945 thought first and foremost to provide emergency relief for survivors and facilitate emigration and resettlement. However, as the JDC phrased it, and I quote, resettlement can be a program for objects as well as for people. End of quote. Thus, the rescue of the remnants of Jewish material culture in Europe was also an area in which the JDC was active. Restitution was one way to secure airless Jewish artifacts for the Jewish collective in which the JDC was involved. The post war restitution of airless Jewish cultural assets has been increasingly researched in recent years. In particular, the Jewish cultural reconstruction, in short, JCR, a, legal, a Jewish legal success organization, which was formally recognized by the US military government in 1949, has received quite some attention. The JCR was organized and run by prominent intellectuals such as Hannah Arendt and Gershom Scholem. Until 1952, JCR field workers discovered, identified, and evaluated in new, numeral Nazi looted Jewish book collections, archives, and ritual objects, successively distributing them to museums and synagogues in Israel, the US, and other countries, as you can see here on the map. The main goal of the JCR's allocations was to preserve the memory of European Jewry after the Shoah and to promote the spiritual and cultural needs and interests of the Jewish people beyond Germany. However, 
JCR had neither the manpower nor the financial resources to realize this huge endeavor on its own. Thus, it relied heavily on organizational members, one of them being the JDC. Having his, this major relief organization as a member made a lot of sense. The JDC had long established infrastructures, local employees, and good networks in Europe to support JCR's comprehensive post-war allocations of airless objects. Rediscovered objects had to be stored safely or examined and repaired by experts. Shipping to many different countries had to be organized and arranged with the customs authorities. The JDC had decade-long experience in all these areas and helped, for instance, by providing storage space, sending personal to Europe, financial resources, and so on. Furthermore, JDC and its other members provided the JCR, which actually only operated in the American occupation zone, access to important information and resources from other countries and occupied parts of Germany. JDC's European headquarters in Paris and its ed education and culture department played a special role in this context. Of the several thousand heavily damaged objects and Torah scrolls recovered after the war, several hundred of them were sent to a JDC warehouse in Paris and painstakingly restored. Here on the slide, you can see numerous scrolls in various conditions in a bin awaiting their inspection. The JDC employed five Orthodox Jews, themselves refugees of the countries from which the Torahs came, to restore them. And here you can see those um, Orthodox Jews, Jewish Torah scribes inspecting some of the displaced Torahs. After being repaired, these Torahs were re redistributed to Jewish communities in Israel and France. Torahs mutilated uh, beyond repair were buried. JDC's Paris office, headed by Jerome Jacobson, was furthermore involved in other activities concerning Jewish cultural reconstruction, such as sponsoring and supporting the local Jewish museum, the Archive et Musée d'Art Populaire Juif, and its exhibitions in Jewish ritual objects. And here you can see a JDC sponsored exhibition in Paris in 1950. JDC <clears throat> employees were also directly involved in the identification of objects and the distribution. For some JDC employees, working closely with the silent witnesses to the Holocaust was emotionally challenging. Young Jewish American Lucy Schildkret, who would later become the important historian Lucy Davidovitz, traveled to Europe in 1946 as a JDC aid worker and spent some time working at the so-called Offenbach Archival Depot. And this depot, mainly thousands of Nazi looted libraries and book collections and archives were temporarily stored. But there was also a so-called Torah room where often Judaica were kept and prepared for redistribution. Davidovitz recalled from the encounter with the amassed Nazi looted objects, which triggered powerful emotions in her, and I quote, the smell of death emanated from these hundreds of thousands of books and religious objects, orphaned and homeless mute survivors of their murdered owners. Like the human survivors, these inanimate remnants of a once thriving civilization had found temporary and comfortless shelter in the land of Amalek. The sight of these mass, inert objects filled me. Davidovitz also described feeling haunted by one particular object. I quote, when I told Horn, that's a colleague of hers, that my hotel room was unadorned, he offered to lend me a menorah from the Torah room. I chose a simple brass one and put it on my desk. Two weeks later, I returned it. Every time I looked at the menorah, I invented another history for it, imagining to whom it might have belonged, where it had been stood in that home, and what it what had become of its owners. I felt as if these imagined people had moved into my room." End of quote. As a look at the JDC's archives demonstrates communication between the various Jewish organizations active in Europe at that time was close, regular, and familiar. In her function for the JCR, Hannah Arendt openly wrote to Jerome Jacobson, the head of the JDC's Paris office, 
about her problems with Jewish cultural property restitution. In 1950, for instance, Arendt reported on disputes in Worms in southwestern Germany, where a non-Jewish museum director named Dr. Illert had obtained Jewish manuscripts, archives, and Torah scrolls from the pre-war Jewish community. Quote, Dr. Illert knows, of course, that he has no right to this material, but on the other hand, he is unwilling to give it up to its legal successes, end of quote. The JCR and other Jewish organizations frequently had to deal with such cases of museum directors who pretended to be saviors of Nazi looted Jewish cultural assets and refused to hand them over to their rightful owners after the war. For Arendt, however, these non-Jewish actors were le the lesser of two evils. She saw a bigger problem in the claims that newly founded Jewish communities made in some places. For Arendt and many of her fellows, the so-called Gemeindeproblem, community problem, was a major one. She added in her letter, quote, I must admit that at this moment, I'm rather happy about Mr. Illert's attitude because as you know, the legal successes would be a half dozen of Jews in minds who in nowhere can be considered a normal community, end of quote. By not normal, Arendt probably meant that in many places, these new congregations were very small, its members old or different from the pre war congregations. She expected them to disband within a few years and therefore feared that returned Jewish cultural assets would be lost again. That is why historian Dana Herman, who has written a history of the JCR, aptly observes that the term reconstruction in the JCR's title, Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, is actually badly chosen. The JCR aimed for cultural renewal and not a reconstruction. But be it as it may, the extensive global and historically unprecedented relocation of Jewish cultural assets by the JCR to new places of Jewish life after the Holocaust definitely contributed to a new post-war chapter of Jewish culture. JCR and other officially appointed Jewish legal successor organizations restituted and distributed approximately 10,000 airless Jewish ritual objects worldwide that had previously been looted by the Nazis. Nevertheless, when the JCR officially ceased its activities in the early 50s, Aaron drew a sober conclusion. Many Jewish ritual objects remained, despite intensive search, undiscovered in museum depots, in cellars and attics, on the art and antique market, or in private households. In May 1952, quote, Arendt felt that there must still be Jewish cultural material which, not, which has not yet been discovered and which therefore could not have been restituted, end of quote. She was right. Time and again, Judaica were not officially restituted, but took other parts. So now I come to the second part, the unofficial reappropriation of Jewish ritual objects. Asked by a reporter of the National Jewish Monthly in 1964 how he became a collector of Jewish ceremonial objects, philanthrope Joseph Horowitz from Cleveland, Ohio explained, quote, in 1948, the Joint Distribution Committee asked me to go to France to help the rescue of refugees and their resettlement in Israel. As a result, they occurred what I like to think of as a mutual mitzvah. And Horowitz continued, all of us who worked with the refugees shared their emotions as we hurried through the necessary paperwork. Just as I finished helping the father of one of the last families to depart, he surprised me by opening his parcel of belongings and with profuse thanks gave me a package, a gift. I was on a mercy mission and I didn't want anything from him, but he begged me to take it, saying it was a mitzvah for him to give it to me. I had to accept. When I got back to my room, I found a Hanukkah lamp in the box. It was silver, filigree, old, well cared for, and above all, beautiful, unlike anything I had ever seen. So this marked the beginning of Horowitz's lifelong passion for collecting Judaica, which resulted in a collection that is today partially housed at the Skilbo Museum in Cincinnati, Ohio. Of course, it is impossible to verify Mr. Horowitz's story, 
but this sort of gift giving seems to have been a quite frequent practice. Numerous times, JDC employees received Jewish ritual objects as gifts from private persons and Jewish communities. In 1948, for example, the Comunita, Comunita Israelitica di Roma, the Jewish community of Rome, presented the JDC stuff with a 19th century Torah pointer and Torah curtain. According to its inscription, the Torah curtain originated from the congregation of Castiglione in Tuscany. A year later, in 1949, a Jewish community in Bulgaria handed over to the JDC a Megillah and Torah ornaments, which were supposed to be shipped to the US. And in 1951, Jewish ceremonial objects from several Jewish communities in Italy were handed over to the JDC and shipped from Europe to New York for safekeeping. In how many cases such gifts remained in private ownership is difficult to determine from the sources. Apparently, most of the times JDC employees would not keep the artifacts the way Judaica Collector Horowitz did, but forwarded them instead to um, Jewish institutions such as the Jewish Museum in New York. It made practical and content related sense to hand over the artifacts from Europe to the trained staff of a museum. However, close ties between the JDC and the Jewish Museum in New York surely also played a role in selecting this particular site of all places as the object's new home. Edward M. Warburg, a co-chairman of the JDC at that time, was also the youngest son of Frieda Warburg, née Schiff, who had donated her husband's mansion on Fifth Avenue to the Jewish Theological Seminary for use as a museum. Its doors opened to the public as the Jewish Museum New York in 1947. In the late 1940s, the Museum Judaica collection was still being built up and there was interest in such permanent loans of Judaica originating from Europe. Another person who was instrumental in building up the museum's collection during this, this initial period and who also had close ties to the JDC was Harry G. Friedman. He was a collector of Judaica and donated almost all of them to the Jewish Museum New York and thus laid the foundation for the Jewish Museum's Judaica collection. Harry G. Friedman had the economic means and religious knowledge to become an outstanding patron of Judaica. He had studied at the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati and was ordained a rabbi. However, he also obtained a doctorate in economics at Columbia University and entered the investment field which he successfully pursued on Wall Street. Friedman's interest in Judaica apparently began in the, light, in the late 1920s. However, his main collecting activity falls in the period between 1939 and 1965. At the same time, he and his wife Adele also supported the work of the JDC as philanthropists. Based on the sources in the archives, we can see that Friedman used his close contacts with JDC employees in Europe to acquire objects for his collection or to obtain an appraisal for pieces offered to him. For instance, he would call the Paris JDC office to inquire about the provenance of a medieval, medieval illuminated Hebrew manuscript that had been offered to him for sale. Friedman's collecting was not a private pleasure, but was guided by the aim of strengthening strengthening Jewish culture in the US American diaspora after the Holocaust. He was of the opinion that Jewish life in Europe had no future and apparently he distrusted similar endeavors to build up Jewish cultural institutions in Israel. These objectives and priorities can clearly be seen at work in a letter from Friedman reacting to the shipment of 800 Torah scrolls and thousands of books to Israel by JDC. And I quote, it occurs to me that the most valuable of these objects, and I hope there are included also other virtual objects for the synagogue and the home, might be sent to this country for traveling display. In view of the fact that so large a part of the funds are raised here, and he's meaning the US of course, I should hope that a rep representative portion of these religious treasures might well be left here in recognition of the financial response response of the 5 million Jews in America, overwhelmingly the largest community whose continuing support should by all means be stimulated. Furthermore, 
in a much troubled world, world considerations of safety might dictate the keeping of the most valuable of these treasures in this country. End of quote. The inner Jewish tensions that become apparent in this quote formed the framework of official and unofficial Jewish cultural reconstruction in which JDC participated in various ways, as I've shown. An artifact that Harry G. Friedman had two versions of and that he donated to the Jewish Museum, a now pretty well-known Passover play produced in JDC workshops, brings me to the third part of my presentation, JDC's support for the distribution and production of Jewish ritual objects. The JDC not only supported the salvation of Jewish cultural heritage by transferring Jewish ritual objects from Europe to other places, Conversely, JDC helped just as much, if not more, to supply Jewish displaced persons in Europe with ritual objects. By the end of war, uh, World War II, about 250,000 Jewish refugees were living in displaced persons camps in Germany, Italy, and Austria. Many Jewish survivors in DP camps were in desperate need of the requisites for the reconstruction of their religious everyday life. It is well known that the need for religious books was met by printing new books, among other things. Besides a Haggadah published by JDC for use among Jewish DPs during the holiday of Passover, Passover the print and distribution of the 19 volumes comprising so-called Survivor's Talmud, um, or JDC Talmud in post-war Germany, a joint project between the US Army and JDC, being probably the most ambitious of all these activities. But there was also a lack of even the simple ceremonial objects as well. The JDC and other Jewish relief organizations reacted to this specific need. In 1948, for instance, religious supplies were distributed to German DP camps in large numbers. 500 prayer caps, 2,000 prayer shawls, and over 120,000 candles, 25 Torah scrolls, and 159 shofars, uh, traditional horns, were distributed. According to a chart presented the same year at the Paris International Conference on Relief, Jewish Relief and Rehabilitation, the JDC spent about $232,000 in one year for so-called sacramental articles. Also, Tefillin and Megillot were distributed. And here you can see uh, how some Tefillin, Torah scrolls, and Megillot uh, were examined before they were sent to um, Europe um, on the right side here on this slide. For some survivors and their families, over the years, these objects became important mementos filled with emotions and memories. They kept the pieces safe and gave them later to publicly accessible collections, such as the JDC archives um, or Jewish museums worldwide. JDC also supported the production of cer ceramic Judaica in the late 1940s. Um, the so-called JDC Ceramic Work Project was located in Mark Drewitz near, near Munich. There, under the auspices of the JDC Religious Department, the piece produced Hanukkiot and Seder plates. 248 Hanukkiot, and you can see one example on, on the left side of the slide, uh, were distributed on the occasion of Hanukkah in 1947. Its design reflects the notion of a promising Jewish future. New life blossoms in form of sprouting leaves from a cut tree stump. The same motif, a cut tree stump with blossoming branch, uh, was used for the design of ashtrays, which were also produced by DPs in the same uh, workshop on the right side uh, of this slide. You can see it. Um, while the Hanukkah candelabra seems to have only been produced in small numbers, Passover plates were produced in larger quantities and in different colors too. Here you can see a blue example today housed in the Jewish Museum in New York and the more classy green uh, version of it. 
not the motif on this plate ha um, had a significant meaning, but its hopeful inscription. This year in Jerusalem, which is an adaptation of the quotation in the Haggadah, next year in Jerusalem. Many DPs were eagerly awaiting the opportunity to immigrate to Palestine. Learning a craft such as pottery should prepare the young DPs for their future life. However, the fact that hopeful Jewish ritual objects were produced had a highly symbolic effect for the whole community, but also for the individual workers in the workshop. JDC had already recognized and applied this doubly uplifting benefit of producing Jewish ceremonial objects long before the Holocaust. After World War I, the JDC supported European war orphans, young girls in particular, by training them in arts and craft schools and by exhibiting and selling their religious items, such as Torah mantles, prayer shawls, etc., that they produced. But let's get back to the aforementioned Passover uh, plates and its uses. The plates were used by survivors in a large number of the P camps for the Passover season in 1948 and 1949. However, this was not the only use of these today almost iconic, iconic plates. Uh, and the second career of the plates is actually less known. So the JDC sent a small number of the plates also to the US to distribute it uh, to officers, executive committee members, and other community leaders as gifts. High-ranking politicians like Henry Morgenthau received the Passover plate, as did cultural institutions. This contributed to the popularity of the plate, as did the publication of an image of the plate in a magazine. Thereafter, several persons got in touch with the JDC and asked where the plates could be purchased. An upstate home furnishing store even encouraged the mass production of the plate and its export to the US. But JDC ultimately decided against this for a number of reasons. One of them being the fragility of the plates, their poor materiality, perhaps due to the poor German post-war situation, made them extremely brittle. They broke in large quantities when a case of them was shipped to the US. Thus, it was finally decided in 1951 by the JDC to keep a stock of 500 of these um, setter plates in Europe um, put them in storage in Paris and give them to VIP tourists um, as a gift. Travel agencies had indicated that 1951 would be a good year for tourists. And it is likely that Harry J. Friedman, the Judaica collector um, I've talked about earlier, um, received one of the set of plates in his collection while browsing the post-war European art and antique market uh, for Jewish ritual objects. The distribution and production of Judaica by the JDC is hardly surprising, as these tasks, tasks fall within the core area of its activities at that time, providing aid to displaced Jewish people in need after the Holocaust. However, not all Jewish survivors were necessarily displaced persons after the war. And it was precisely the JDC's strong focus on the DPs that led to criticism. In March 1949, Rabbi Stephen S. Schwarzschild concluded a report on Jewish communities in Germany with the appeal that, I quote, it must not be forgotten, Judaism in Germany continues to exist. This statement contrasts sharply with the widespread assumption by most of Jewry worldwide that the history of Jews in Germany had found its end, as famously phrased by Rabbi Leo Beck right after the war. Of course, in the wake of the Holocaust, most Jews, ost Jews ostracized the land of the perpetrators as a banned country. Germany was considered to be a temporary transit zone for displaced persons at best. However, Stephen Schwarzschild radically disagreed. In his report, he criticized in particular American Jewish aid organizations like the JDC for losing sight of the fact that there existed also German Jews in need who wanted to stay in Germany for various reasons, who would who did not live in displaced persons camps, but in German cities and organized themselves in re-established new or newly founded Jewish communities. Following Schwarzschild, those German Jews needs had to be met also and especially in material terms because they were the ones who would be maintaining Jewish tradition 
on soil saturated with their blood under the most difficult conditions in spite of technological and economic obstacles across blockades and counter blockades, as he phrased it. Schwarzer drew his conclusions from own experience. He served as a rabbi in the post-war Berlin Jewish community. Originally from Frankfurt am Main, Schwarzschild had fled to the United States in 1939, attended Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he was ordained as a rabbi in 1948 and subsequently returned to Germany, so he could temporarily taking over the role of community rabbi in Berlin for over two years. Thus, he knew the hardships and needs of post-war German Jewish communities that were, according to him, not addressed properly by Jewish relief organizations focusing exclusively on DPs. Since Schwarzschild was devoted to the spiritual care of Berlin Jews, he knew that in addition to basic necessities such as food and clothing, many Jewish survivors, German Jews and DPs alike, were explicitly longing for religious objects for ritual practice and spiritual rehabilitation. <clears throat> Even though um, the situation in Berlin was particularly troubled due to increasing tensions in the wake of the Cold War, other congregations such as the Frankfurt Jewish community raised very similar criticisms. JDC actually felt the need to react to Schwarzschild's open letter. In a reply, JDC accused Schwarzschild of stating false facts and generalizing emotionally. JDC added a list of the relief supplies distributed to Jewish communities in Germany. In fact, it is documented that the JDC gave at least one of these, uh, in total 50 Torah scrolls to the German community in Frankfurt. As I've shown, using the example of Jewish ritual objects, the JDC attempted to promote Jewish cultural reconstruction or Jewish cultural revitalization in various ways, by supporting official restitution and unofficial reappropriation, as well as by the distribution and production of ritual objects to Jewish survivors in Europe. Schwarzschild's criticism makes clear that JDC's actions were not uncontested and touched upon much larger and controversial questions concerning Jewish futures after the Holocaust. Who was the rightful heir of European Jewry and its cultural heritage? Where would the new centers of Jewish life be? While some persons and institutions involved were concerned with saving the remains of the material European Jewish cultural heritage to mourn for and remember something totally gone, others were longing to revitalize Judaism in their own spiritual and religious life. Whether the objects were to be displayed in a museum showcase or used in wor worship or intimate prayer, whether the artifacts were used for Holocaust commemoration, study, or practicing religion, it was always about dealing with the past and tradition for the unknown future. Especially on an individual level, the confrontation with the material remains discovered after the war seems to have had a lasting effect for many. For the Orthodox rabbi, uh, Orthodox Torah scribes mentioned earlier, to give an example, they were themselves um, survivors of the Holocaust uh, and hired by the JDC in Paris to repair the partially broken Torah scrolls. It was, as a JDC document describes, a labor of love in their own process of mourning and healing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Anna, for a really fascinating lecture. I think we all, um, we all really learned a lot today. Um, I'm going to now open the floor to questions. Um, just a reminder that your microphones are muted and to send us the question via the Q&A function on, on Zoom. And I see, Anna, that we already have a few questions. Um, so the first question, uh, could you please repeat what happened to the Torah scroll, scrolls that were beyond repair? I think this is something you mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation. So I think this refers to the um, Torahs that were repaired or some of them were repaired and some of them were beyond, were not, uh, it was not possible to repair them anymore. 
And so um, a document in the JDC uh, archives actually states that these um, Torah scrolls were to be buried. I think it was Israel. They were sent to Israel and then buried there. That was at least the plan. I don't know if this was realized that way, but that's what the document in the archive says. And that's actually the, the, the right way, so to speak, um, um, to, yeah, to handle um, Torah scrolls that cannot be repaired anymore. Um, so here's another question. My late uncle said that shortly after the war, while he was working at Goldblatt's department store in Chicago, there was a large sale of Jewish artifacts that had been stolen in the war. Do you think, do you know if this was unique or whether a lot of misappropriated material was sold rather than repatriated or delivered to museum and cultural institutions? Um, actually, I came across such sales several times. Um, so, for instance, there were some um, artifacts and also um, um, artworks, paintings and, and um, drawings and so on um, that um, were considered by the Jewish cultural construction to be sold on behalf of uh, Jewish survivors. And this sale took place, I think, in New York. Um, in the early 50s and um, also in the JDC archives, I recently came across um, several other um, su of such sales and um, um, sale catalogs, um, which also took place during that time in the early 50s in New York, um, Parker Bernard was uh, one place where such sales would um, take place um, always on behalf uh, to raise funds for survivors. Um, yeah, and they were supported by even the, the United Nations, as I saw. So that was quite a common practice. I wasn't aware of the um, Goldblatt uh, store in Chicago. So that's that's interesting for me to, to know. And I will follow up on that. Thank you very much for sharing this information. Um, next, we have two questions that are about the path um, of those artifacts, where they went to. So the first question is, um, I will ask the first question, the second question first, because it's shorter. So the first question is, were any rescued items sent to Australia? And the second question is, are there records of the rescued Holocaust Torah's peripatetic path to active congregations outside of Europe? I know there is one at my synagogue in New Orleans and in that of a French synagogue in Washington, D.C. Has a history been written of these object survivors precious in terms of both religious and cultural significance? Um, okay, so the first question concerning Australia. So um, officially no um, objects have been, or Judaica have been distributed to Australia um, by the Jewish cultural reconstruction, at least not um, uh, in the official documents that I have seen. Um, but what, what we have to keep in mind is, of course, that um, these objects uh, had a, a, a life after being distributed. And so some ended up on the um, international art and antique market. And so, of course, it is possible that some of these objects um, ended up in Australia um, and can be found there today, especially with books um, that were distributed in, in much larger numbers, of course, um, by the Jewish cultural reconstruction, um, we can see that um, almost everywhere. So if you go into bookstores in the US, in Israel, um, in any country, basically, you uh, can find books with a book plate in front of the Jewish cultural reconstruction. And um, that is because, of course, not all institutions that were given objects by the uh, Jewish cultural reconstruction um, are still in existence today. So some of these cease to exist. And then of course, objects have their afterlives and travel on and um, yeah, go from hand to hand. And so, um, yeah. So in Australia, officially not, but maybe um, in, due to the, the circulation on the art and antique market, it's possible that some objects ended up there. 
And um, the history. Um, so can you can you maybe briefly? So, yes, the, the second, second the second question was um, a, per, uh, a person's. The person wrote that um, there is a Holocaust tor Torah in. Um, their synagogue in New Orleans, and there's one in their front synagogue in Washington, D.C. And in fact, the question is whether history has been written um, of those object survivors. Um, if, yeah, I guess it's more a question of um, where, what, what the literature is about, about that, that history. So I mean, there's there's a lot of literature um, about this this uh, topic. Um, one of I would say the most convincing works is by Elisabeth Gallas, A Mortuary of Books, which is basically a history of the Offenbach Archival Depot. But she deals very uh, thoroughly also with with other uh, aspects. Um, maybe she is not following. Um, each and every Torah scroll that was um, distributed, of course, but but she gives a very interesting overview on what happened on site and and what it meant, especially for the for the actually pretty well known um, actors involved like Hannah Arendt, uh, Lucy Davidovitz, and so on. So this is something I would highly recommend. Also, Dana Herman's a work uh, that I had mentioned in my talk about uh, the Jewish cultural reconstruction as an institution. So this is more like an institutional history that she has written, also very uh, interesting. Um, and I saw that there is um, online, if you, if you Google Holocaust uh, Torahs, you can find a homepage uh, where um, there is um, where they try to kind of um, map where Holocaust Torahs ended up. So this might be very interesting to to um, consider. Um, so you basically can can see where Torahs were um, distributed to, but not by the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, but later on by by a British initiative. Um, that had um, bought uh, many, many uh, Nazi looted Torah scrolls uh, from Prague. Um, and later on, I think it was in the 60s, they were distributed worldwide to Jewish communities. And yeah, some of them ended up in and, the US. And that website is, did you? I would have to look it up myself. Um, okay. So it's okay. Maybe if yeah. we, if maybe if we find it, we send it. Um, in, in our um, post Zoom email to our yeah. participants. Um, we have one more question, Anna. Um, do we know who designed and produced some of the artifacts, um, menorah, setter place, et cetera, produced by the GDC after the Holocaust? Were the designers European survivors, Americans? Were they produced by hand in factories or in factories? Mm. Yeah, that's something I really would like to find out, but um, I couldn't so far. So the sources in the JDC archive do not give any information about that. Um, I found some names of workers that worked in the workshops, but um, I couldn't follow up their paths so far. So I don't know if they continue to work um, in this uh, pottery field. And I don't know if they were the ones designing the plates and the Hanukkiot and so on. Um, but for sure, that's a very interesting question. Also, I would like to find out more about the situation on site in these workshops. So were they, for instance, um, working side by side with, with Germans, non-Jewish Germans at that time? How did that work? And um, so that's something um, I will continue to work on, but I have no answer, unfortunately, for now um, to give. So we, we have um, two questions actually that followed up on, uh, on what you just said now and what you just said earlier. One question following up on what you just said is, uh, where were the workshops located? In Mark Drewitz, that's near Munich. So it's in Bavaria in the southwestern part of Germany. And the second is someone shared with us um, the memorial scroll Trust exactly. Website. Thank you very much, Kira Schuster. That's exactly what I what I meant. That's perfect. Um, Thank you so much for looking. Maybe it up. we can share this in the chat with everyone so that um, our participants can can who want to to look at that website can do so. Um, 
Thank you, Anna. This was really interesting. Um, thank you to our participants for joining us today. I hope that you all enjoy the program. Uh, the next GDC Archives program will take place on February 21st. Dr. Devi Mays will give a lecture entitled Forging Ties, Forging Passports, Migration and the Modern Sephardi Diaspora. The program is part of our webinar series, The Latin American and Caribbean Jewish Experience in the 20th Century. And you can register for the program via the GDC Archives website. Invitations will be sent in early um, February. And we hope that many of you will be able to join us. Please sign for our e-newsletter if you would like to be added to our mailing list for public programs. And last but not least, we are currently accepting applications for the 2024 GDC Archives Fellowship Program. There is also a link. Um, th this can also be found on our um, website. And um, we hope to see many of you soon in another program. Thank you. <laughs>